I'd like to call this regular Board of Education meeting to order. Um, today, <laughs> we have Tim Neville is doing our invocation in moment of silence. So, Mr. Neville. Tonight, as we have done for the past few months, we're going to be discussing the 2015-16 board budget. It's that time of year that all elect elected officials dread. Too little money, too many needs. How do we find a way to meet the community's needs and at the same time minimize the negative impact of significant cuts on Enfield citizens and especially its children? It will take wisdom, courage, and a spirit of compromise to successfully navigate this process. Let's pray that God gives the council and the board enough of all of these to do the right thing for Enfield. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Neville. In the event of a fire or an emergency, the emergency exits are to the rear of the chamber or down the stairs to my left. Please proceed out to the parking lots. Kathy, may I have roll call, please? Mr. Neville? Present. Mrs. Thurston? Here. Mr. Janitis? Here. Mr. Peabody? Present. Mrs. Ungeyer? Here. Mr. Wawer? Mr. Grady? Here. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Chairman Sorard? I am here. Board guests, Dr. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, we're going to welcome our STEAM coordinator, Dr. Faulkner, and our Enfield High School Earth Science teacher, Sue Boucher. And they're here to talk about an award that uh, Ms. Boucher won as an honorable mention for the Earth Science Teacher of the Year. And she's going to tell you a little bit about what was involved in that and certainly uh, respond to any questions you may have about the award or the, uh, the Earth Science curriculum. I, I don't plan to say very much. I want to just uh, I want to congratulate Sue. Sue has. Uh, Sue is one of our really exemplary teachers. I'm sure a lot of you know that. She's been with Enfield for a long time, and uh, when we saw this uh, potential for an award come up, I called her up and I said, we need to have you apply for this, and so I'm going to let Sue tell you about it. Um, this was through the American Association for Petroleum Geologists, um, and uh, it's a very prestigious organization. Um, geology organization is about 36,000 members. Uh, that are uh, part of this <clears throat> this organization, um, and the the it was a uh, based on energy, and so I submitted uh, an energy curriculum that I've done with my earth science students as well as uh, an integrated physical science class that I had last year, and uh, it was based on sustainable energy um, as well as uh, nuclear energy. We we talked about all different types of energy, and we did all kinds of projects related to that. Um, the, pr the award was also associated with uh, the after-school programs that I um, conduct um, throughout the year and uh, what I brought to geoscience education in general. So um, I won uh, the Eastern United States Teacher of the Year, and then I uh, participated in the national um, competition and came in honorable mention out of six people. So. She it was, was a thrill. She was second place. She's being humble. She was second place in the nation. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Our second set of board guests was going to be our um, two representatives and state senator, but as you saw in your email and they uh, let us know earlier today, the legislature was running late in session today, so they will not be here. Uh, you will notice from the email that Mrs. Alke sent out, they have offered us an open invitation to come visit them at the Capitol. They feel that may be a better way for uh, us to find them as opposed to them, uh, unfortunately, getting tied up coming up here. So that is an open standing invi invitation. If you um, would like us to help you reach out to them and set those appointments up, we certainly would be happy to do that. Okay. Anything uh, since that's done, then go right into the superintendent's report. And we'll begin with our student representatives. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you may choose the uh, side you'd like to start on. There is some information from them in your packets already. Christy. I just have a few things this week. Um, last Monday, I had the pleasure of attending the CAS Awards at the Connecticut Association of Schools. From Enfield High, it was me for the Visual Arts Award and Aaron Blaze for music. And it was really nice experience. Kids from all over the state come. From Fermi, it was 
Rachel Wright for visual arts. I'm not sure who got music. Um, this week is our spirit week. Friday we are ending with a pep rally and Thursday we have a dodgeball tournament fundraiser. And a couple days ago outside we got picnic tables because we are still in the auditorium for lunch and the students are enjoying them a lot and they're very happy with that so thank you. <laughs> Thanks Christine. All right Tom, get the floor. All right, uh, well actually today uh, the eighth graders from JFK came and I was a mentor for one of the kids, brought him to my pre-calc class. I think that was a great thing. Learned how to um, learn what a pre-calc class looked like and I know a lot of kids got to see a bunch of other classes so that was good. Um, tomorrow, well, uh, Wednesday, is all the kids visiting France and Spain. They leave. So um, I wish them luck. Um, a lot of fun in Europe. I mean, I wish I was going. It was great. Uh, family Science Night is this Thursday. It's at 6 o'clock, so anyone who wants to go, it'll be great. Um, booths will be set up by, you know, chemistry, physics, biology classes, and uh, Buzz Robotics will have a booth there. And Buzz Robotics went to WPI this weekend as a district championship, and they finished second out of 60 teams. Um, so currently, Buzz is ranked seventh in all of New England, and uh, I'm proud to be a part of it. And so as we go to national championships this weekend in St. Louis, it'll be good over break. So I'm excited for that. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thank also, sure. we have invited the uh, Buzz Robotics team to... Uh, come visit us when they return from nationals and uh, so they'll have some things that they're going to show us including a uh, an unbelievable video that will hold until uh, until they return um, at our last transition meeting we talked to uh, Amar about uh, the project manager for the construction project at Enfield High School about getting into the new steam wing and he said it is ready for us to tour uh, some of you are aware of that already we received an email the tour is the first tour will be next Monday uh, we're going to meet at 3.30 at the trailer and then walk over. So the tour will start around 4 o'clock, about an hour's tour. Uh, we do need to know if you're interested in going. We've invited the building committee along with the town council, the board of education, and uh, representatives Alexander, uh, Kiner, and Senator Kissel. Uh, the reason we need to know by Thursday is that Omar can have hard hats for everyone. Everyone must wear a hard hat. It's a hard hat area, so he's got to make sure he's got enough on hand. And he's also recommending that you wear some type of work boot because we will be crossing the construction site in order to get to the facility. So those are available. If you are, would like to go, please let us know by Thursday at the end of the day so we can give him a, an accurate head count on Friday morning of how many hard hats he needs. There are also several... Um, uh, April events taking place are all in your um, packet under um, superintendent's report item C. Please note the second one is uh, the elementary in interschool concert will be held at Eli Whitney, not JFK. So if you're going to that one on the 15th, that is in the Eli Whitney school, not the JFK auditorium. And the rest are there for you to, uh, to observe. And that is all I have for you. Thank you, Dr. Schumann. Do we have a list for audiences? Thank you. As always, I would like to remind everyone to keep your comments brief. You must state your name and address and uh, refrain from personalities. There's a three minute time limit each time you come up. So starting right off the bat, we have Shannon Grant. Shannon Grant, Yale Drive. Uh, I first want to thank all of the board members who were able to come to the invention convention a couple of weeks ago. I hope you enjoyed yourself. It was a, an astounding success. We're very proud and we're very happy to continue the partnership with uh, the Enfield Public Schools on that. Um, but I am here today because I had the opportunity to attend the Fermi committee meeting on this past Thursday. Um, as you all know, but it bears repeating, the question at issue is whether the Board of Education will maintain control over the use of Fermi for educational purposes, um, presumably um, for the town middle school. Uh, I'm reaching there, but um, I think that's part of the discussion, so it bears, uh, bears mentioning. 
Um, after reviewing the numbers and assumptions and what is not being discussed but should be, um, it is clear that the committee has not completed a full due diligence of the costs that they are working under. Far too many assumptions to make recommendations in the near future. The board should not vote on any recommendation without all of the information. When the committee presents, they will likely tell you that three things. Uh, the estimated cost to add on four classrooms to JFK is approximately $3.6 million. The necessary immediate upgrades necessary to use Fermi would include $660,000 for ADA compliance and another $1.5 million for upgrades and remediation of the science rooms at a total of about $2 million, which is less than the addition to JFK. But they will also tell you that the committee believes that the upgrades to Fermi would not be subject to partial state reimbursement, uh, whereas the construction of JS JFK likely would tipping the money scale back to JFK if we were to consider just these numbers. What the committee may not tell you is that there may be some ADA issues at JFK, the costs of which are not being considered. The town has not been performing regular maintenance to Fermi in anticipation of it closing down. The town has tipped the scales in favor to some would say their predetermined plan by creating an additional financial burden to correct regular maintenance issues that have been ignored for far too long. They will also not tell you that the four-classroom addition will not solve the inadequate space issues at JFK, not even close. There's been discussion of filling JFK's pool with cement to accommodate the band music room. The committee's scorecard identified spacing issues in the JFK cafeteria and states that an additional building addition may be needed. The committee's scorecard reflects that the physical education facilities are not sufficient for the population and potentially necessitating, necessitating yet another addition. Fermi has adequate space in the classroom, gym, library, cafeteria, kitchen, band, and auditorium. Fermi can accommodate far more of our population than JFK, likely even enough to accommodate the imminent increase in population when the casino is constructed in Springfield. The four classroom addition will not solve the gym, cafeteria, or band space problem for the student population we have today, never mind in the future. Some of the committee members believe that JFK is a nice facility on the inside, but according to the scorecard comments, many of the facilities are either insufficient for the population and some areas are subpar. And anyone who has ever transgressed the JFK mud pit, and you know what I'm referring to, the field in the back, uh, knows exactly what I'm referring to. You have to wear muck boots to watch your children go through cross country or soccer. If that field is not an ADA nightmare, I don't know what is. Based upon the assumptions that the majority of the cost to add on to JFK will be reimbursable, it appears the committee is preparing to recommend surrendering Fermi to the town. However, given all of the unknowns, I think the committee be, may be preparing to sell the board a lemon. The committee has yet to consider the cost of upgrading the JFK mud pit, the cost to expend the JFK gymnasium and cafeteria, and the cost to fill in JFK's pool in the band, for the band room, and the cost to bring JFK up to ADA compliance, among other things. When making this decision, the board must consider that Enfield today will not look like Enfield tomorrow. The construction of the casino is imminent, and there will be a change in our population in the years coming. The casino will hire workers, and others will desire to position themselves closer to the new market. We can and should position ourselves to attract more of the middle and high wage earner to better balance our community demographic. In order to do that, we need to offer services that the populations desire. Key point on that list is a good education system. I've heard that we don't have the money, but yet we don't yet know the true financial cost of either decision. It may be that maintaining JFK is the far more expensive option in the long run. Further, and quite frankly, the amount that Enfield will expend on armed guards in the next two years is about the cost to upgrade for me at this point. At this point, given only the information provided, I believe the clear choice is to use Fermi as our middle school, and I know a large segment of the population feels the same. So the challenge is that the committee, in performing its investigation, should be prepared to provide the unknown financial information and convince me and the people of Enfield that their recommendation is sound. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donna Dubinowski. I live at 23 Betty Road, and I come 
before the board tonight to discuss Common Core and the SBAC testing that is currently going on. Everyone in town, not just parents with children in the school system, should be very concerned about the cost of the Common Core program to us as a town and as a state. The governor is looking for ways to cut the budget, and so are you. I have a suggestion, which is to put Common Core on hold. Everybody should be asking why, are we, why we are rushing into this. Instead of cutting the mental health, we, sh we as a state need to cut Common Core. The state spent millions of dollars just on TV commercials to get you parents to accept the Common Core standards. Remember those? Um, a, a commercial just to brainwash you into going along with what the Common Core program is. We as a state and certainly as a town need to stand up and stop the excessive spending to purchasing technology that in all likelihood would be outdated long before we taxpayers pay it off. Look at how many millions of dollars are being spent on Common Core and that the state had set aside almost $15 million just to transition into it, even though none of the standards have been tested. I was shocked to hear that the principal at Prudence Crandall and the superintendent were telling parents that they could not opt their children out from the testing. Those parents were not told the truth. All parents should be informed about the SBAC testing, the results, and who will have access to those results. The data mining is a violation of privacy. All of you parents hold the rights to your children's education, and that includes their personal information. <coughs> Excuse me. Parents must understand that, they, that if they do opt out, that the student should not be in the testing classroom. Per the SBAC protocol, no student or adult should be in the testing room if they are not the administrator of the test or actually taking the test. The real reason the school administration doesn't want the children to opt out is because we need the 95% to participate in the testing. If you're sitting in the classroom and not taking the test, does that count as participating? Does the student get a zero on the test, but the participation rate gets counted? Prudence Crandall is not providing a place for students to go to read or do homework, per what I found in the protocol. Parents need to sign the student out of school during those testing periods, which are 90 minutes long for six days. Then there are two days of those six days that they have a classroom activity later in the afternoon, running anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour, which the student is also signed out of school during that time. Now, I don't need to explain that making it very uncomfortable or impossible for working parents to take their children out of the school during the testing period, it's a strong-handed way into making them take the test. Remember that they need that 95% to participate. So it's either the school bullying the student by making them sit and stare for 90 minutes in the classroom during the testing, or bullying the parent because they would have to drive to the school, pick the student up, and return them for every test. Also, let's remember this testing is for grades 3 through 8 and 11. This program was never approved by Congress, federally or at state level. It's never been field tested. They say it's about getting standards, setting standards. It is not. It is about an entire curriculum change. Enfield needs to go back to allowing our teachers to teach and not having their performance based on unproven test claims. The SBAC test is designed to ensure failure because it's testing children at two and three grade levels above their present curriculum and because it requires significant computer skills just to get through the test. Because of the computerized assessments will determine the next question based on the student's answer to the previous question, the claim that the national tests will uniformly measure students learning across the country are not valid. Teachers are spending much, too much class time teaching to these flawed tests that only seem to measure how well students can take tests that in many cases they are not developmentally ready for. In other words, they're testing what they don't know rather than what they do know. This, as we all know, is because of the money. Common Core is a massive waste of public funds and is also a loss of local control of education. I ask the board that while you are trying to balance your budget, to seriously look at the cost of Common Core and start there. Stop the direction of federalizing our children's education. In the future, I want to be able to come before the board and express my concerns as a taxpayer. Parents and town residents, we all need to get involved to stop Common Core in Connecticut. We have to stop it and all the expenses that come with it as we just can't afford it as a town or a state. Thank you for your time.
Hello. My name is Kristen Johnson. I live at 553 George Washington Road. Please allow me to begin by thanking the teachers in our schools who embrace our children as their own for nine out of 12 months each year and continue, continue to serve our families as true pillar, pillars in our community. The role that our educators play in our children's lives is one of great value and importance. I stand before you today in an effort to share my family's experience with you when trying to opt out of the SBAC test being implemented through the Common Core Initiative. I hand delivered a letter to Prudence Crandall on March 16th stating that my husband and I wished to opt out our children out of the SBAC. I received a call from Michelle Middleton on, on March 23rd, one day prior to the commencement of testing. Ms. Middleton informed me that it was illegal to opt out and by law, my children would be required to test. I told her that I was very aware of the Connecticut state law and it did not require and it did require mandated testing annually, but there was no provision in place that did not disallow parent refusals and no consequence of legal action that would enforce any form of punishment to families whom decided to in fact opt out. Ms. Middleton informed me that I would be receiving a letter from the administration outlining the Connecticut state law on this matter. I then informed Ms. Middleton that I as well would be revising my previous letter to include section 10-14N of the CT state statute that in fact does not disallow parent refusals. The following morning, I again hand delivered my letter to Ms. Cox Blackwell at Prudence Crandall. She informed me that my son Matthew, a third grade student, would not test. You gotta stop using the names. <laughs> you, can, oh. you can say principal, you can say vice oh, principal. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Stop using the names. Okay. Uh, would not test but be forced to remain in the same classroom as his peers during testing. When I asked her if he would be able to read during the testing, she answered with no. The best I can do is to see if he can begin reading when the first child finishes testing. I asked if Enfield was implementing the sit and stare policy, to which she answered with a resounding yes. I expressed my concern to her that this was not only against SBAC handbook protocol, but it was also, in my opinion, an act of punishment for our decision and crossed the line into immoral and unethical behavior being projected on a child. She then informed me that this decision was not her own, but in fact came from the deputy superintendent. As testing for my child in third grade began on that very same day, and I did not have arrangements to remove him for the testing period while I was at work, Matthew was in fact forced to sit and stare for much of the 90 minute testing period. When I asked him how his day went, he was visibly upset with the notion that he was singled out and could not read quietly in an area away from his peers. <coughs> My husband and I met with the superintendent on March 26th. Our hope was to inform him of our concerns of the sit and stare policy being implemented and possibly come to an understanding and agreement that the school was in fact in direct violation of the SBAC handbook protocol wherein the test administration manual called for, for and I quote from page 10, section 3.1, security of the testing environment. Students who are not being tested or unauthorized staff or other students must not be in the room where a test is being administered. This requirement is again stated on page 25 of the test administration manual. The superintendent informed us that his directives come from the State Department and he and the administration risk funding if they do not abide by said guidelines. Why then, members of the Board of Ed, is my child being used as a pawn in a game of politics and money? Why is my child not allowed to sit quietly and read while other students are being tested? And furthermore, and most importantly, why is our administration lying to parents and telling them by, that by law we cannot opt out? As you may or may not know, the opt-out movement regarding the Common Core State Standards and Associated Test has garnered serious attention, much to the dismay of policymakers and politicians alike. Of equal importance, may I remind you that opting out is not a form of civil disobedience, nor is it an anti-testing movement. This is a movement to reclaim and do what is right for our children and all children in public schools. This is a movement to restore true learning and encourage imagination and, I'm sorry, spending on standards and testing has taken away from funding, music and arts programs, for example, and could be better allocated elsewhere. This is a movement that displays the courage of few against the overwhelming power of many. This is a movement that has planted its grassroots foundations firmly in the idea that education lies in the hands, hearts, and minds of teachers, educators, and parents in the community, as opposed to the hands and wallets of lobbyists and corporate royalty. Politicians have no business in the testing, teaching, and learning world. Their business is not here, and my hope today is that I remind you all that your business and absolute duty is here to our children, to our community, and to our teachers. Your duty is to protect and represent those aforementioned individuals and not blindly follow rules handed down by the State Department in its attempt to appease the individuals behind the Common Core State Standards, which in no way, may I add, were in involved the state. 
These standards were imposed on a federal level and had nothing to do with the state beyond the fact that we have abided by them for no other reason than for financial purposes. Our children are not and should not be used as tokens in a game of power, politics, and money. Our children should not be exploited all in the name of standardized testing. Education is, uh, is not a business that can be or should be bought. Education is and should only be about giving children the opportunity to expand their horizons while enriching their minds. Standardized testing is not the way, and capitalizing on the assessments of children is not only immoral and unethical, it is detrimental to the well-being of our children. If you judge a, bit, a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its entire life believing it is stupid. Much like fish, our children's intelligence and the performance of our teachers must not be based on the ability of how well a child tests. So, in closing, I urge you, members of the Board of Education, to stand beside me on my journey to reclaim education from the hands of politicians, lobbyists, and corporate cronies and put it back in the hands in which it belongs, the educators, teachers, and parents whom see and know these children and work with them each and every day. I urge you to stand beside me on holding those accountable for using fear tactics and false claims about the legality of testing to force parents into testing in order to maintain the 95% participation needed for funding. And lastly, I urge you to research Common Core if you haven't already. Don't take my word for it. I am passionate in my endeavors and I hope that you all will be as well. We are sliding into a territory of callous and calculated decisions made by many that have no direct connection to education or children alike. Thank you for your time. I apologize, I didn't write my name down. It was taken prior. My name is Elizabeth Davis and I reside at 201 North Maple Street. First of all, thank you all for all that you do. We appreciate it. We know you're extremely busy with the budget. And now it's nice weather and you'll be missing that because you have to fix the budget a little. I would like to uh, diddle everything Shannon Grant said about Fermi becoming the middle school. It was a great point she had and you know, great job with that. And I fully support that. I think that would be an asset to our our town, our kids, and the school system to move JFK or junior high to the high school. It's bigger, and, and we put millions of dollars in the field and everything, so our kids would have better stuff. Question I have, and it came up before, the fingerprint and the background checks for the volunteers in the school. I know I turned on and said, you know, I'm fingerprint, I'm security clearance and all that. Personally, I don't really see a major issue with it, but that's me. But you have a lot of parents, and everybody knows in school as volunteers are already, we are slim as you can be. Now with this policy, we're even slimmer when we were slim to start with. So it's extremely hard getting volunteers. You have book fairs going on that every single person needs a background check and to be fingerprinted. The beginning of the year, book fair, 21 volunteers. I think our later one will probably have five because the fingerprint started after. So you just took, you know, how many parents out of the school. My big question is when you look at the parent involvement responsibility policy, so I believe you guys all saw this because it's your guys, and in it, every single part is saying all parents, families, education, you know, make family involvement and education priority. So having parents the whole way through is parents being involved in the school, parents being part of the education. It's one of, you know, working together as a team with the school and everything for our kids to benefit. Then you have the volunteers in school, and what really gets me is nowhere's on here even says a fingerprint on any policy I can see, and talking to every surrounding town on their education, no one's doing it. So I think it's, you know, why is Enfield the one to do it so we can have even less volunteers with our kids? I understand the safety aspect of it, but if you look at the volunteers in school, okay, participated by public citizens, assistance to school personnel is is what the volunteer in school is okay for that's the citizens assistant right where does it say when the whole thing says parent involvement on one and then when we're doing a background check no fingerprint is the citizens assistant in the school to me i take that as two different things one's the community coming in is where the background check is all over here is everything's on parents. I'm just wondering, and maybe I'm misunderstanding it, where does it line up together that everything's about parents with the Board of Ed to be involved, and then when you come to volunteers, it's saying citizens from the community to be involved is what a background check's for. 
So I'm hoping some clarification because they really don't. And one's parent. Are we a parent or are we the community and a citizen? I, I take it as we're parents, and that's what the policy was for parent involvement. And I understand if you have the community coming in, you'd have the background check. They're not involved in the school, but parents are involved in the school. So I'm hoping to have some clarification on the two. And my other little question is, says policy adopted 6909, but we really adopted it in 2015. And it, it's such a slam down our throat after the school year started. What was the major reason that after the school year already started, and five years, almost six years later, well, five and a half, it is jump and just threw it at us to be fingerprinted background checks and lost our volunteers as it is in the school system. So there's a couple things. If someone could explain the two different policies, how the word is totally different, and what took five and a half years to implement it, and then it was a major, if you don't have it immediately, you can't go on the field. If you don't have it immediately, you can't show up during the day. Um, when it took five and a half years to implement it with none of us knowing. So if we could have some explanation. And then thank you again for all you guys do, really. We truly do appreciate it. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Um, Davis. Love you, Liz. <laughs> it's always nice to end on a positive note. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Um, board member comments? Mr. Neville? Yep. I've got a uh, number of things uh, uh, to comment on uh, this evening. First of all, the Lego celebration that uh, we went to a couple of days ago was just spectacular. You know, a number of the board members were there. Um, seeing what our kids are doing with that program that the Lego has so generously put into our, our system is just phenomenal. Uh, I, I was personally just uh, totally impressed with the kids themselves as they stood up and cornered us if we weren't asking them questions, to ask us questions. And they were, they were so poised, and I'm talking third, fourth, fifth graders. I wasn't that poised at fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And they just did a wonderful job, and, and they were so creative. Uh, and so I, uh, kudos to, to uh, all the folks, the teachers, and everybody who's got, who, who got involved in this. But uh, our kids uh, represented us well, and, and, and I'm, I would encourage you, if you haven't gotten there before, to go in and see it when it comes up again. It's just spectacular. We do a lot of good things here, and we don't talk enough about the good things that we do with our kids. Uh, secondly, I had the opportunity uh, with Dr. Schumann to go see, I believe it's the Innovation Lab, which, and it's just opened, I believe, probably days before we went in and for a tour, and I, uh, a couple of folks from LEGO were there, and we all went down and saw that. Unbelievable, and I believe that was funded largely through um, a grant uh, from, from LEGO, if I'm not... Yeah. No, LEGO was not involved with the grant, but the um, executives from LEGO and Mass Mutual and some other companies came together and helped us think through what that lab should have. But it was funded by a state grant. I encourage the board and, and citizens to get in there and uh, and see it. And uh, and hopefully when we work on our volunteer policy, we won't have to have you go through that in order to get in there. It's very impressive. They're using technology in a very, very creative way. And um, it, uh, it at not a lot of cost either. And, I, and I, I, it was very, very impressive. And I, I, I think we should uh, somehow get a demonstration of that for the board at some time. I'd love to have the board be able to go and, and have have the uh, the folks demonstrate that to us. I think you'll be suitably impressed. Um, so uh, I would uh, highly recommend it. Thirdly, um, we've had uh, we've all been talking about the budget, you know, as I said in at the my, my opening comments there. But uh, we've been talking also to town council members, and they've come to us with a number of questions of, for data. Okay, and then through the chair, what I'd like to do is I've told them I would come back here and 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 uh, get some of that data. But through the chair, if I can put the questions through to you and get them to all the boards so they see them so that you can ask the uh, administration to put them together. And I'm going to say fairly quickly, they're not hard questions. Some of them are just specific questions about the data that was presented by Dr. Schumann. I'll be happy to collate it and get it back out to them. But um, they're asking. I would like to be able to give them the answers they want to help them in their deliberations, if that's okay with the chair. OK? And, and the board will get copies of everything. That's, that's, that's it's, it's, standard OK. Um, the steam wing visit, uh, as we've been going to the building committee meetings and watching it rise you know, out of the ground here, you know, the mud right now, but uh, soon to be uh, cement, I think. Um, uh, it's, it's incredibly impressive. I've been dying to get in there, and I think this opportunity is great. Kathy tells me that three or four of us have already signed up. I would encourage you, if you can possibly get the time available, to go. I, I think it's, um, 
it's a tribute to all the work that we've done to get that building done uh, and and the work that the, these guys are doing now, I, it's very, very impressive, and I, I'd, I'd love to have us see the results of our labors here. It's, it's really impressive. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to the kite meeting on April 1st, and I've been the last couple of meetings. Uh, we, we did um, something we've done each year, and, and I, I commend the folks for it. They have uh, a vision, they have goals, and we go through and evaluate those goals. It's a bit of a tedious process to kind of get develop a consensus there, but it's a very, very important process. I enjoyed it, and, and I, it was a good discussion, and uh, I, uh, I commend those folks for the good work they do, and they have done for a number of years on behalf of our, our children. Um, going to Shannon Grant's comments uh, in terms of the future use of the Fermi uh, uh, committee that we have here. I went to the meeting and skipped the building committee meeting this Thursday because I've been asking and, and, and uh, that to get a report to the board. Uh, part of the, the um, charge to that committee was to meet and come back and report to the board what the status was. Uh, I heard more data there than I've heard in the last year and a half. Okay, we have not had the, the data that you may have had or, or the members have had uh, by going to the meetings, uh, but um, it's taking too long to get that data together. I talked to Ray today. Ray had volunteered to collate that material, but I understand you don't have the material to collate yet. And, and I, I was looking forward to getting that data that was described there, and uh, I think you're going to do it in a comparison type of thing. Uh, we, we, it's gone too long. We need, and I'm not blaming you, Ray. I know you're willing to do it, but I think it's, and, and we're all busy. We all have lots of stuff to do, but but I think the public is looking for us to put this data together and come to some conclusion, whatever that conclusion is. And I just, I, I'd like to get that done as soon as possible. The, and the, and the, the last item I have is really has to do with the volunteer committee. Again, it's, it's something that uh, many, if not all of us, we've been getting uh, uh, queries from uh, citizens, parents, and, and, uh, and educators about the volunteer committee. And I think some of it's misinformation, some of it's misinterpretation. Uh, I've been told that it's state law that we have to do this. It is not, categorically, it's not state law that we have to do this. I was on the original committee that put together the 2009 policy, and that, that from my perspective, that was not the intent of it. I think it's an interpretation of the policy, and, I, and, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I think we've raised the question, and we've been trying to talk about it for a very, very long time. Uh, the last time we, uh, the, the appropriate place to talk about it is at policy. The last policy meeting was December 12th. I was there, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I got ill and had to leave that meeting. But we have not had a meeting until the one that's coming up on Thursday morning. Um, it affects just about everybody. I think uh, there's a, a, a very, very large concern about what it's doing to the volunteerism and the, um, the participation that we want parents to do and, and, and get involved with this, this community. And I, I think uh, we have to deal with it. And so it's finally on the agenda. Unfortunately, the agenda has over 20 items on it uh, for, for Tuesday for a two-hour meeting. That's, that's like eight days' worth of meetings. I, and I'm wondering whether we're going to get to it. That's my concern. It's at the appropriate place. It needs to be addressed. I have my own feelings about what we should be doing there. But I, I think uh, I don't know how it's going to get addressed in time to deal with all of the class days and the events that happened at this time of year in all the schools. So I'm urging us to some, somehow trim that agenda down. This is a, a longstanding old business that needs to get addressed. And I'd like to see it put up early in that meeting so that we can get it addressed uh, in terms of meetings. I would rather they take place at night because people who work could get there. 10 to 11 uh, or 12 in the morning is not a great time except for us, us retired folks that can get there. So I would, I would like to urge the chair to see if we can do something about that because I think that discussion needs to take place. I think the policy needs to get back to this board at the latest by the last uh, meeting in April. And I think that we should expedite it. Uh, in fact, I will be offering, if the board wants to go along with it, that we condense the two readings into one meeting so that we can get this thing done. I think the public has a right to have that done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neville. Ms. Thurston. Thank you, Ms. Thurston. Mr. Janitis. Hold on. Have a book. <laughs> Do, 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 do. 
Okay, first of all, Shannon, I'd like to thank you very much for your summary. I think it was spot on. So you take away from my comments on the Fermi use thing for the most part. I think you you uh, gave out a lot of very information, a very pertinent information, and uh, thank you. Uh, Donna, once again, thank you. I could have put those in my comments too. Uh, this Common Core stuff is, I still think from the very beginning, is absolutely ridiculous and this SBAC testing and stuff. I thought I had asked at the last board meeting, Dr. Schumann, whether or not we were uh, letting kids opt out. And I, th I assume that when you said we were, to paraphrase you, um, following state guidelines, that, that we were letting them op opt out. But apparently it seems to be still be being a problem here. Uh, and if it's for that 95% participation rate, that's, that's, I don't know, unacceptable. Christian, thank you very much for saying what you had to say. And again, you brought up some things that uh, seem to be rather cloudy. And uh, this board, I think, should find out what the bottom line answers to some of the things that you brought up. And Elizabeth, thank you, too, for the fingerprinting comments. The mushy stuff at the end, yeah, I don't know, but uh, the fingerprinting stuff, absolutely, sp again, spot on. So for all four of you uh, people who spoke tonight, I, I really appreciated what you had to say today. Uh, I hope everybody was listening very intently. I wish there were more people that would come out and make comments similar to what you just said, the four of you. <clears throat> And I do actually agree with two of the things that you brought up, Tim. <laughs> right down, right down. Again, the fingerprinting, fingerprinting thing being the biggest one. I mean, this thing has got to come to an end. Um, when I saw on my computer today that email about the uh, uh, policy committing agenda and everything, I, j I just couldn't believe it. Because you and I, well, I went in before you did at, at that last meeting to, into the hospital, and you followed. Um, and now we have this thing. I thought that was the general purpose of that last meeting. And I would like to say Thursday when we go, I, I, I'm going to make a motion. I, I hope David is there and Vinny, you're the other member, I believe, that we put that item up first to discuss. And if it takes the two damn hours, then it takes the two hours. But I don't want to get sidetracked with all this other stuff um, that, that has been added on. In fact, I don't even want to vote on it until I get the chance to read it and look at it, look over it. Um, and then that Fermi use uh, thing, the committee. I mean, this is, I don't know, this is almost ancient history when it started. And, you know, collecting this, collecting that, you know, we're the Board of Education. You ask for information, you should be able to get that information. Uh, and this has really, really gone on way too long. And I think it does leave the perception that this is all part of a grand scheme to let that building fall into tremendous disrepair. And I do know, because I remember having conversations uh, when I was teaching and Tim was the principal, about if you add on to JFK, I remember distinctly you saying we can't go on in between the buildings because of things that are buried there too. Um, so we have things buried at both schools. Uh, and I don't know what the architectural plans are or, or what they're suggesting, but. Uh, I'm going to have to be very careful about what we're doing over there, too. So other than that, uh, you four ladies, I want to thank you so much for the things that you had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Janinas. Mr. Peabody. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank, uh, actually congratulate and thank Mrs. Boulay, uh, Boucher on her work, uh, especially in geoscience education. That is a key science stream for our country moving forward, especially in terms of energy and, and self-reliance in that field. So I think that's, that's fantastic. She got recognition for her good work. Um, some of the things that have been happening on a more positive note, 
Uh, I was able to attend with uh, the mayor to the uh, Parent Leadership Academy, one of their classes where I spoke about the board and how well we work together. Pause. Okay, and um, it, was, it was an interesting, interesting conversation and the questions and stuff uh, that I was asked. I felt as though I was uh, on trial or being queried in a uh, board of inquiry, uh, but good stuff, great participation. I think those folks have become advocates in our community for our kids and for, for everyone in our community. Just a tremendous program. Um, totally uh, uh, support that program. And if you have an opportunity to, to hit it up, hit it up, because there's a lot of good stuff there. And what's really cool is a lot of it is that some of the training and some of the education I got in college and in business schools uh, are being presented to, to our citizens, our, our residents, sorry, our residents. And um, I just think that's going to be very helpful to them, including public speaking. So when this thing's done, we're going to have people who are not shy. And uh, watch out. You, Tim, you might get what you wish for for participation. Um, I did go to the Lego celebration, and there are a lot of Board of Ed people there. And, uh, you know, one thing i got to say, I've seen it twice. Our children in our schools are very good presenters. Uh, they start, I've been to a couple fifth grade events where they're presenting what they're working on. Even second graders doing their dinoramas at Barnard. Not afraid to speak, and they speak uh, from their intellect and from their heart. And it's a lot of fun to, to go and observe. Um, I also uh, participated in an Easter egg hunt. No, I was not the Easter bunny. And, uh, you know, we had thousands, a couple thousand kids there and thousands of eggs, and it was a blast. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is it's run by two moms on a mission. And there's a couple ladies that have an organization and their sole purpose is to raise funds to support our kids. Uh, they've done it for SafeGrad. I went to one of their auctions for SafeGrad for Enfield High where I, um, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I beat, I outbid Tina on, a, on, a, some, on an object. Um, it's just really good. It goes, ties right in with our, our, our first reader program and other programs we have for our kids. Um, I did hit up the uh, Henry Barnard uh, Ice Cream Social. Uh, which was to distribute, uh, they're right by my house, I get there. Ice cream, I'm there. You know, it goes to waste, my waste. Um, and they're passing out their books in their book sale, and those kids are just really happy, grabbing their books. Kids are passing out boxes of books, and that's, that, that's part of what school's all about, part of what education's all about, is on, stuff that happens outside the classroom. All right, now to some more serious and serious topics. The uh, volunteer policy, and I agree with uh, Ms. Davis, and I agree with Tim, having read the policy, and even Peter, uh, there's no, no mention of fingerprinting in the policy whatsoever. And what I'm kind of curious on, and I, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Dr. Schumann, why did we start it? And why this year versus other years? I think that'd be a good question to uh, get answered and out to folks. We all know we gotta, we gotta take care of our kids. We have to be safe. That's very important. However, there comes a time when we've got to kind of temper things and have a little bit of common sense in that space. And it's not a dig on the policy. That's just a reality. Um, and yes, I would like to see this become the highest priority possible at the, uh, at the uh, policy committee meeting. It needs to be dealt with. And whatever we can do to expedite that before we hit field uh, day season and class season and, and everything else that happens on here, field trips and stuff, we've got to get that thing done. I have had information from a number of organizations that have talked about being involved in the schools and how hard it is for them to be involved in the schools. And as a working parent, I had a hard time making time to get to schools. And when I was traveling, if I was here on a Friday and I stopped by, I wouldn't be able to do anything. Because I, I would get up, leave, leave my house at 3, 3 o'clock on, on Monday morning and get back maybe Friday morning or Thursday night. So parents who travel, we have a lot of people that do that. They need a break, and grandmom and grandpa, and that's all I'm going to go with there. You just got to resolve that issue. Um, budget information, uh, yes, I did find some of the information I was looking for by going through and di driving through the website, which Dr. Sh through you, uh, Chairman Serrard, to Dr. Schumann, is not the easiest website I've ever navigated through. In fact, it's one of the more difficult ones. Some of the ones I used to straighten out when I was in charge of website building. So we need to we need to give uh, get some help to to our guys and kind of. Get that fixed. Um, Fermi reuse. Oh, I'll go back to the budget for a second. We need to have a workshop or two. Questions and answers. 
not to establish numbers, not to sit there and tear through and make additions and subtractions, but to have a mutual understanding of where the money's going and what it's going for. We do not have that right now. I don't think we do. So therefore, we can have that understanding. We can then present the council with more information and may help them and assist them to make an informed decision. And I think that that's important. Fermi reuse. One thing I have to say is it took us forever and a day to get some architectural data and information out of the town, out of the town manager. And not only did town pound on them, I did too. And it wasn't the most pleasant of conversations. And they did get us to us, so we asked in May, early May. We did not get that information until I think after sometime in November. And then we asked for some additional clarification and information on the very things that um, uh, Shannon was bringing up. And we're just starting to get dribs and drabs of that data. Um, going through so many other things, I don't mean to be so long, but there's a lot of stuff happening here. Shannon, thank you very much for your work. I appreciate it. I appreciate the email and uh, the additions to the scorecard and recommendations that you made. Uh, we're trying to be factual, so we kind of like uh, put the emotions aside. Appreciate the input. Um, let's see. Ms. Mrs. Dombrowski? Yeah, I got it. And I can tell you this. The state of Indiana backed out of Common Core, but they did use some of the principles of Common Core in their statewide curriculum. State of New York, they had troubles, significant troubles, implementing Common Core. Um, I won't go through all these details, but I will tell you this. When I went to the state capitol last March, there was a woman, and I don't recall her name, PhD, who helped establish Massachusetts pr program, uh, Race to the Top. It got um, mutated into something different than she did, but she was on the approval committee, and she did not approve Common Core. Neither did the math PhD that was on the committee to approve Common Core. But it got through. It got through because you have publishing companies, testing companies, and a guy named Bill Gates supporting it. And, but to be fair, there's a need for changes in curriculums across the country. I thought that STEAM was really handling it well. Uh, you know, I'm in technology, in the world of technology, and the STEAM program just got me all you know, really hopeful that we'll be able to have our kids compete with other countries that have had this type of education in their curriculum, these subjects, whether it be computers, uh, sciences, engineering, whatever, for, for decades, 1993, they started. So we're really behind on them on curriculum. But we still have a fantastic school systems throughout the country. We spend over $500 million per state on average on education. It's not, unfortunately, it's not all coming here to Enfield. But there's a lot of work to do there. Um, Mr. Johnson, thank you for showing up. Appreciate it. Appreciate your words. Uh, I take them to heart, um, and again, I can only go back to the state and how and and, and the, and the uh, hearing that I attended, and it was unbelievable how the entire state board of education came out, and I'm going to use the term shoved, Common Core upon us, the evaluations and every and, and and everything that's tied to it. But we have to give kudos to our superintendent; he went toe to toe with the state commissioner of education on evaluations. And what a compromise for the town of Enfield, saving us a big, big load of money. I think, what was it, a million or two on, on evaluations loan time? So that, that's the kind of stuff that we're doing behind the scenes. Um, I will tell you this, I did go to JFK's uh, orientation night, and the curriculum teams with the teachers came up with an alternative method for teaching mathematics. you got the common core piece, but they also have the, quote, normal, unquote, uh, uh, mathematics piece being taught as well. So our kids won't come out of that totally confused and confuddled and be able to function in society as normal people. Um, I think that's enough for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peabody. Ms. Ungar. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank all the audience participation. Um, I appreciate all your comments and I admire your passion for your children and your articulate and um, I appreciate all your comments, and I really take them to heart. Um, I attended the Hazardville Memorial PTO meeting, and they've got a lot of things going on there. Um, a great new principal over there, and a lot of parents came out for it, and uh, that was interesting. I also attended the JFK Lego celebration, and that's one of the fun parts of this position, is seeing the kids and all that they're learning and listening to them describe all their projects, and uh, I really enjoyed that. It was great. Um, I also attended the egg hunt on the town green, 
and I'd like to commemorate the two moms on a mission. Um, it was also sponsored by the Enfield Public Schools and ShopRite also sponsored it. And they had a beautiful display where all the parents <laughs> and families could have their picture taken with the Easter Bunny and, um, and there was a great turnout for that and the kids loved it. Uh, I also attended the CREC Council meeting in Hartford and I also have another meeting tomorrow with the CREC Council. Um, I want to congratulate Christine on her award. That's wonderful. Um, I also want to congratulate the Buzz Robotics for what they're doing. We look forward to hearing more about that. And um, congratulate Mrs. Boucher in her Teacher of the Year Award. I think that's wonderful. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Ungar. Secretary Grady. Well, last Thursday I was able to attend a, um, I guess you want to say a, a meeting on Internet safety that the schools put on. Uh, the fifth grade classes were all uh, brought over to Parkman School during the day, and he talked to a Mr. Driscoll. He was a retired police officer, and he brought up the safety of uh, Internet use and the apps that you have on your phones. And, of course, every kid has a phone in the school system now, even in the third grade. I don't know why, but they do. Um, uh, he brought up some really good points for the parents at night. Uh, I wish it was a little better attended, but not a bad crowd there. Um, I know my kids aren't as young as some younger kids now, but um, it's kind of scary what's out there and what these kids can access through uh, an app. Uh, but I would say be involved with your kids and make sure they don't have some of these apps on their phones. Um, it was a, I believe it was uh, something presented by Kite and Lego. Was that was that am I wrong? That funded that that thing there that night. I think I'm not sure. Maybe the presentation they funded a, a thing. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, but but thank you. But it was a good it was a good program. So and thank Mr. Driscoll for for doing it. But that's about it. Thank you, Mr. Grady. Ms. LeBlanc. Yep. I would like to congratulate Ms. B Mrs. Boucher. Um, I have heard many wonderful things about her, and I actually got to see her tonight. Um, my daughter had her for a short time at Enfield High, and then she moved to biology, and um, Mrs. Boucher was very helpful with that, and I congratulate her on all her hard and extra work that she does. Um, I also attended uh, the JFK Lego celebration, which um, I was so impressed with uh, the kids and their ideas. Um, some of their, some of the kids, they um, they were charged with a certain idea. Like some kids got to make a um, dream playground, and that was really exceptional. They had bumper cars, they had hot tubs, they had, um, and always keeping with safety. Safety was a big <laughs> issue in these playgrounds. Um, there was um, literary pieces, the Diary of Anne Frank. Um, there was um, things on the states and um, outer space. And then they had the, I thought it was cute that the younger kids did the motorized ones um, and they had crocodiles and they had little Lego figures and the crocodiles were a eating them. Yeah, and the monkeys banging the drums. It, it was phenomenal to see. Um, in the, and then you, they had little Lego um, statues throughout the hub at JFK. So when I was going around um, the hub, I, I went to school there. They ha are painting new murals and they are fabulous. Um, there's one of the town hall with a student painting it looking down. Um, there's one that's actually, if you've ever been to the Rachel's Challenge program, there's um, a whole piece on Rachel's Challenge and that one is phenomenal. Um, if you can go there and see that. And a little ad lib to that, there's still a pink panther with an old phone that was there when I was there. And I said to my husband, look at that pink panther with the phone. And my husband says, the phone booth. And my eighth grader said, what's a phone booth? <laughs> uh, Terry, you put a pay phone. What's a pay phone? I'm like, oh boy. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Um, but those, those murals are great. And I believe it's one of the art teachers over there that's heading that up. And the kids stay after school and participate. And I just think that's, that's great. Um, I want to touch on the legislature's comment, leg the legislators' comments. Um, I think it's far easier for three of them to come to nine of us, and they represent us, and we vote for them or not. But it's far easier for them to find out when we have meetings, considering, you know, most of us work and 
don't necessarily do this for a living, do this for volunteer time. That's my comment on that. I would prefer not to go to the Capitol. Um, the, uh, as far as um, Liz goes on the fingerprinting, I'm there 150% on that. Um, I like to volunteer in the school. Um, I'm on my last spell because my youngest is in fifth grade, and if I want to be able to be a chaperone on the field trip in May, I have to go and get fingerprinted and, and be a part of that. And I, I just, I understand the safety. And I think that there needs to be some guidelines for those on the policy committee. I understand if you're going to have chaperones in different situations like Buzz Robotics or the band where you need to be an overnight chaperone. I think I would, I would, we could all agree that, yeah, people should be fingerprinted and or a background check for something like that because they're going to be with students for an extended period of time off the school grounds. So I'm hoping that the policy committee can come to a consensus and we can move on with that. Um, Shannon Grant, um, I can honestly tell you, no matter what comes about, unless the money savings is huge, I'm never going to support for me as a community center. Um, that just comes from having children at JFK, having teachers talk about the crowded space at JFK, having the students talk about the crowded space. Um, I would hate to see one of our schools go back to the town or one of our school buildings. So unless there was some extravagant amount of savings, I will not be supporting Fermi as a community center. Um, Mrs. Um, or Donna and Kristen, I appreciate you guys coming out and talking about Common Core and SBAC testing. It's funny because I don't know if you guys are on Facebook, but there's this thing that goes around Facebook and it talks about like math and common core and it'll say you have three apples and 12 pancakes equals and then it comes out with, well, there's purple aliens on a roof. And it's kind of a chuckle because I have, um, my youngest is in fifth grade and he comes home with math and we have to ask my sophomore or my eighth grader to help him because they're much more used to Common Core and the strategies of what they're learning. We'll have to look stuff up on YouTube like we did last night for fractions, and I'm not lying to you. I understand what you're saying about Common Core. I also understand what you're talking about with the testing because um, before the SBAC, it was the CMTs. And my kids, they do a lot of things great, but standardized testing is not one of them. And that's set them back in some ways as far as not being able to take a language in the middle school. And um, so I uh, really appreciate you coming here and you know opening my eyes to things um, about Common Core. I'm living it with you, so I see that. I do feel that parents should have that opportunity if they have that passion and have the will to want their kids to opt out of it. And I really appreciate you taking that role to say that you you felt that strongly about it. Um, I wish more parents would get more involved like that and really do their homework. So I really appreciate you guys um, coming out and talking about that because it's not often that the parents do actually come out and speak about Common Core. So, um, And you were very articulate and very knowledgeable and I really appreciate you coming out. And um, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Levine. To reiterate what pretty much every board member has said, uh, I, I kudos to Mrs. Boucher. She's she's she did a wonderful job. She represents Enfield at its best, and, and again, it's a a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, sometimes when I'm sitting up here, I get to educate <clears throat> on how the board works. Now, committees do not make board decisions. Committees do all of the hard work to present the board with information to make those decisions. That's where the work of the board gets done, is, is in the committee level. That's why each board member has a responsibility to attend their committee meetings. And that's when they know what they're talking about. That's where they learn. And that's where they get the information and they're supposed to keep us up to date. Um, some, of the, some of the committees that are rolling are backlogged, and I won't lie to you. Some of those committees have been moving along swimmingly and they're pretty easy to deal with. Um, Policy is, is a tough one because policy, to answer well, not another question that was brought up today, is about law. Now, law is two different kinds of laws. There's, there's the consequence of a law, and then there's the actual implication of a law. Both are law. 
And typically, a policy is devised by an attorney who advises us in order to, one, make sure that we're in compliance with state rules, and two, to make sure that we don't expose the school and our kids to liability. That's a consequence of the law. So it's covered by law. That's what policy does. Now, policy steers the ship, and all the administrative regulations come out after that. So policy is the basic general structure, and everything after that is called an administrative regulation, which is how you make the policy work. That's why we have the policy committee. I agree with you that there's, there's a lot of stuff on that committee's agenda, but there's a lot of stuff that's happened this year that we have to deal with. It is what it is. As far as my understanding of why there is a change in our, in our policy is because of the heightened awareness that we got hit with two years ago. It's that simple. We started evaluating ourselves and reevaluating ourselves, and we were advised to create a policy. And it was advised to us by our attorneys. And those are the guys that we pay to make sure that, hey, we're meeting the compliance and we're also covering all of our butts. So it is what it is, and I, I can't, and sometimes it takes a long time to fix it, but it's not like we're blowing it off. We're actually addressing it and we're doing it the right way. Um, the Common Core stuff. I appreciate everyone who comes out and speaks about the SBAC testing, the teacher evaluation system, what's in the curriculum, shows that you care. I can recall when I first became chairman, I asked, I said basically the same things that everyone who's said tonight, and I asked, please help us. Step up, send me an email, please, please. And I got seven of them. There's 46,000 people that live in the town of Enfield, and I've got seven citizens telling me, please stop. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, I wish our, our educational system wasn't as test-driven, but it is. We are a function of the state. The Board of Education is a function of state law. We are created by state law. We have a loose tie with, with the charter, but we are a state animal. They're the ones that tell us what to do, and they pretty much tell us how to do it. And they have a very big stick to threaten us with. They threaten us with our funding, and they also threaten us with receivership. They can take over your board of ed like that. Then you have no say. And that goes right back to the state representatives. The state representatives are the guys that are the ones that pass this stuff down to you. Those are the guys that are responsible for all of this stuff. The guys that want us to go to the Capitol. The guys that won't talk on TV. I know they're busy. I get it. But come on. <laughs> um, budget. Uh, I've heard it say every year that I've been on the budget, the budget cycle is broken. It's backwards. We justify our budget. The town just, and we have to wait until months after all of our budgets are approved to see where we're going. I am concerned about the state this year. I am very concerned about the state this year. And I'm asking everyone who can hear me, please call your state legislator and please tell them that the Constitution of the state of Connecticut says you have to fund K-12 to education and the colleges aren't part of that. Please. There's very few requirements that the Constitution says. That's one of them. Education is K to 12. The colleges are a separate entity. And you can't say that you're funding education if you shuffle the deck and most of your money goes to stores. So, that being said, let's move on. Unfinished business, continued budget discussions. Can we flip-flop 11, 10, and 11 if we're going to do the discussion about the budget just so they can Good point. Just Do I have a motion to suspend the rules? So motion. moved. Motion Second. made by Mr. Peabody, seconded by Mr. Neville. Do I have any discussion? Good. Show of hands to suspend the rules. Very good. The rules are suspended. Do I have a motion to place item 11A prior to item 10? Second. Motion made by Ms. Thurston, seconded by Mr. Grady. Any discussion? Sensing none, show of hands. So be it. 
Moving on, we're suspending item 10 until after item 11A. I'll item 11A, approval of the Head Start Enhancement Grant, Head Start Services Grant, and Head Start Link Grant. Dr. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tonight we have our Head Start Director, uh, Mrs. Clement, and our Family Support Coordinator, Mrs. Bowles, with us tonight. Uh, they're going to give you a brief update about the Head Start program, and then there is a memo you've got about the grants that uh, will require your signature if the Board authorizes that uh, after you hear their presentation. Thank you. I want to thank you for doing that. I'm an early to bed person, so I really appreciate that. Um, we are here tonight to give you an update of how our year has been progressing. I'm Deb Clement, Director, and this is Kelly Bowles, our Family Support Coordinator. And we've had a great year. Um, our students are making tremendous progress. And in February, we had a federal uh, environmental health and safety review. And we got the report back, and we were compliant on all areas. So woohoo! <laughs> we're always happy to get that. And we have had good family engagement this year. And um, you know, there have been some concerns with the fingerprinting that has made it challenging. But we've still perceived, been uh, able to uh, keep that family engagement going. And I'd like to turn it over to Kelly to report on that. Thank you for having us here. Um, we love to be able to come and tell you how wonderful our parents are with their family engagement. But I have to say one of the great things about Head Start is that we do focus on family engagement as part of the child's education. And when we meet with the parents at the beginning of the year, we explain the importance of the readiness with the parents, being there with the children from through all the activities during the day and at night. We understand it's hard because some work so what we do is we try to bring workshops in the evening as well as during the day, and I have wonderful attendance at them. We did have a great fall with the dads. Um, the dads did a lot of um, activities with the children, reading to them one-on-one, -on -one, and also doing a lot of arts and crafts that carried on to the mothers in the winter. And then we also had a wonderful parent activity night with the Enfield Fire Department, Don Ellis. That was a huge success last month. and. Um, my very favorite thing that we did this year that the parents are so proud of is their STEAM festival that they had last month. They planned it themselves. They worked together on a committee to plan it. They also volunteered that day. Luckily, they were all fingerprinted, and I would have loved to see more, but we did have a huge amount show up. The kids loved it, and the things that they're already learning at the preschool level will, will carry on through all their years at the Enfield Public School. And the parents thought thought of the whole STEAM concept for their Winter Festival by the building that's being constructed right outside our front door. And they wanted their children to be able to learn before they go into kindergarten what STEAM is so that when they do get to Enfield High School in 15 years, it's something that they <laughs> will love already. The parents are really excited about the STEAM wing, and they wanted to bring it into their homes by teaching their children about STEAM. And the children are learning in the classrooms, and the parents have just grabbed a hold of that, and they're having, they had a wonderful time with that festival, and we had some visitors, and it was great. So um, thank you, and um, we just hope for more continued success with our parent engagement. Okay, so again, we'd like to thank you for your support, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about the grants. Great, no questions. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> I think he signs all of it. I think he signs all of it. Yes, we have to have a motion. So we're, we have to. We have to all right, do I have a motion? Motion. Second. <laughs> Motion made by Ms. LeBlanc, seconded by Mr. Peabody. Any discussion? What is the motion? Okay. Oh. To approve the grants, the Head Start grants. <laughs> we have a motion to approve the Head Start Enhancement Grant, the Head Start Services Grant, and the Head Start Link Grant. Motion. Hmm. Motion made by Ms. LeBlanc, seconded by Ms. Thurston this time. Any discussion? Sensing none, and I have roll call, please. Mr. Neville? Yes. Mrs. Thurston? Mr. Janitis? Yes. Mr. Peabody? Affirmative. Mrs. Ungeyer? Yes. Mr. Grady? Affirmative. 
This is LeBlanc? Yes. Chairman Serrard? Yes. Motion passes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Good luck. Going back to unfinished visits, business, the continued budget discussions. Uh, Mr. Neville. I, I think you're aware of this, uh, Mr. Schreiber, but I, we were kind of working with the numbers, and the numbers I was working on, I was afraid they were wrong. I had gone to Dr. Schumann and asked him to validate those, which is he came up with the resulting document that was in our packet, this yes. colored one. I was looking at, I thought it was 2.4. It's actually 2.874 percent in the hole here, okay? 2,874,000. Two yeah, that's right, okay. And so we're, 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 you're, we're looking at, but last year we were a million dollars shy in our budget, and now we're looking at two point, almost 2.9 million dollars that we are shy at this point in the process. And Dr. Schumann, if you would correct me if I'm wrong here, the document you put out, the impact statement that we have that's on the website, 13 pages of, of cuts and impact, um, in order to make up that $2.9 uh, uh, million dollar budget, we'd have to take two-thirds of those cuts to do that. Would that. Is that correct or am I wrong on that? That's approximately correct, yes. It doesn't matter which two-thirds. It it's all very, very serious cuts in order to, to add up to that $2.9 million. And that's an astounding figure, okay? And we, we haven't even gotten to that point. But anybody who looks at this, and I, it's, it's mind-boggling to look at it and see what types of cuts those would be. So um, I appreciate your work in getting this done. I know you're, you're really, really busy, but we all want to work with accurate numbers here if we're going to be talking about this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neville. Anyone else? I do have a lot, but I'd rather do it in a budget workshop than out in this particular meeting. Very good, sir. Anybody else? <coughs> yeah. Oh, could, we, could we schedule a budget workshop uh, that, that, that we could look at this? Do we have any no. days available between now and the, the town's presentation, the, pre the budget presentation to the town? Okay, do we have any days available before, before the 23rd? Take a look. I'd look it up on my laptop style, so. Okay, 21st and 22nd, there's nothing on our calendars that I have for committee meetings or anything. What's the 22nd? 22nd is a Wednesday. A week from Wednesday? We schedule something for uh, the 22nd? You may. You won't have Mr. Dressick or myself. We're both going to be away. Is that during the vacation week? Correct. Okay. All next week is vacation week. How about uh, there, there is an event on, yeah. there is an event on the 16th that I'd like to go to, but it's the Family Science Night. That's Thursday, but there's also a planning and zoning meeting a lot of people probably in town are going to be interested in. But if we can do something then, because we got to get this thing nailed down. Uh, that would be like Thursday. I mean, I guess next week's all. I, I could do Thursday. It's, it's, it's no building committee that day. Out. 
We'll be participating in the kite focus group, so you you can we can find you a room. We won't be present. All right, here's the way that the way that I'm looking at it, and and just as, I'm not taking the the but the meet the meeting off the table. I just I want to put some focus to the conversation. We're we're in a really tough spot, and and. And I want to I want to put some flavor to this so you'll understand why I mean. For the first time in a long time, the state legislature is talking about monkeying around with the ECS formula again. They're serious about it. They're not they're not playing, which will probably mean less down the road anyway. Now we've we've asked the superintendent to produce a list that would allow us to make educated adjustments to our budget which is posted on the website, which you said the two-thirds of. And this is where we go to work. I mean, my what I would do is I would assume and work with the, with the, with the town manager's budget and go from there. We can always add back, but go from there. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see any other option. I, I really don't. Um, Dana. All right, Chris and uh, Dr. Schumann, are you guys away all next week? I can meet right after the Steam Wing tour. Okay, That'll but you're not available on, on the 23rd? The 20th, on the 20th, on Monday. I can do that. I can do the 20th. Can everybody do the 20th? No, and I won't, even if I'm free. I'm tired of the hypocrisy here. I asked all of you, I sent emails to you about four or five weeks ago that we should start doing some talking about this budget. Two, two or three of you replied. And now you want to do this and think you're going to solve it? We're going to get together again and just, I want this, I want that. We can't get rid of this. We're going to complain to, about the state and stuff. We're way overdue. And I think it's time some of you face up to, oh, God, it's just dry. So, no, it's not good with me. So. You're on? You on? Yeah. Can we all make it on Monday? Um, I'll have to adjust. Yeah. Sure. Can we at least get a consensus of the board on Monday? Can we get a... I can be the... All right. Book it for Monday. Okay. I, I'd like to add in one thing just about your comment there. I'm not ready to look to, to, to make that cut in the 2.89 to, to deal with that kind of level of cut, okay? Because if, if we go and make that cut... Okay, I still think I still think there's members of the council who are willing to, to work with us on a number. I think there has to be some number that, that, in my opinion, the superintendent has to bring to us and say, this is the bare minimum. There will be cuts, but this is something we can work with. But for us to go and cut 2.9 million, you wouldn't want your kids in this school, and and I think you'd want to you know to, to re rethink your commitment to to it if with that level of cuts. It's the worst I've ever seen, and I've been around for 40 years here, and I'm just not ready to say that that's okay, and I'm going to cut that. I'm not. So, I mean, I just, I, it's just too, too much, okay? And I think, Peter, the issue of not doing it earlier was, was all about timing, okay? I know what you're thinking, but it's all about timing. I think there's still discussions going on. I think those people are pretty good people, and I think they, they are starting by asking the questions they're asking us, they're yeah, starting to understand yeah. the dilemma that we're in. Freedom of dinner. I mean, besides the fact, Tom, that there, there are some fundamental dinner. budget issues that have to be resolved over time, okay? You, you can't deal with our IT budget, pay for it one year, and then give us back $2 million of deficit every single year. You, you, we're, we're behind the eight ball, two million bucks all the time when we do it that way. So, I mean, I, there's, there's some fundamental budget there's issues that have to be dealt with. But that's not dealt this with is now. A, this, is a, this is, again, just so that we can, we're all talking about the same thing, and sometimes the public doesn't always listen. Half of our increases are insurances. Yep. Period. We have no control over our insurances. We have no control over our benefits. We have no control. That's something that's set by powers high, high above us. We have no control. That's all we're half of it. But they would be worse if we had negotiated if, some of the contracts. And it would be worse. The most, again, I've always said it. The board of ed, the most that we can do locally is kind of limit the bleeding, and it's been that way for a very long time. Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's no, there's no arguing. We limit the bleeding, and every time that we do what we believe is the right thing, they 
throw more fuel on the fire or they add something else that we got to pay for that we're not getting help for. And it's, it's that simple. It's And again, I'm going to say it, the budget process is backwards. I wish the feds would come out with their budget, then the state, then the town, and then we could be fine. Because then we would eliminate all of the arguments. We wouldn't be pointing fingers at each other. And it would allow the people who actually set our budget to be held accountable. But also... The other thing we, you have to keep in mind, I think, as a board member, at least it's in my mind and it's perfectly clear in my mind, is that every time we go and do contracts, you've got to be aware of the fact that you're paying for that year after year after year. Every time you add new programs, you're paying for that year after year after year. You've got to know what's coming. And we just built up this fence so big now I, somebody just said, I don't know which one of you two, but th it's never been like this. But we're paying for things that we've added. And we've got, we've got to start looking more careful at the things that we add. And if we do add something, then something's got to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to keep a balance here. We're a public uh, board here. We're responsible for giving and providing the best education we can, but we we can't print money like the federal government. We just can't do it. And you can't keep going back to the taxpayers and asking them over and over and over again. I, I, I just saw some stats somewhere in some, some stuff I was reading. The number of, of elderly, 65 and older in this town. Uh, the number of people that are on Social Security and stuff. You know, you can't keep tapping them. You really can't. I mean, I just went on Medicare as of the first of the month. And I'm too late, two years late. Um, and on a fixed budget and stuff like that. I mean, I don't have kids. I don't have bills and stuff like that. So, I'm, you know, I can get by. But there are a lot of people out there that can't. They really can't take any squeeze anymore. And as much as we want to do things educationally and what we think is best for the students, we still have to always keep looking over our shoulder. What's it going to cost now? And what's it going to cost in the future? And sometimes I think... We're not always looking that, at that. Right, right. In the year I've been on the board, when something was added, we've eliminated other, other programs, Peter. they um, escape me right now, but we just did it. It was in a math, uh, language. in foreign language. You know, if so something was added, something was. So this year, we started to take that, your thought process, Peter, and apply it to reality. The other thing is, to, uh, I think people need to know is, we already got an idea what the state's reducing our, our, their share of uh, education by. Last year, they contributed $29,696,000 to the town of Enfield. This year, it's going to be $28 million, um, around $28,600,000 coming from the state. And that's going, to be a get, that's, that's going to be really good to get. We need more, but it is, it, it is a situation. Um, of our operating budget, needs to be stated, 51% is funded locally for, for this year. 43% came from state, which is still our taxes, it's a different pocket, and 3.9 million comes from federal and private grants. So those are the things that, that we're wrestling with, or wrestling with, depending where you're from. And it's, it's, it's not going to be the easiest things to do. I'm done. It's good. <laughs> Ms. LeBlanc. I guess for me, what I would want out of a budget workshop is a prioritization and a consensus among us as to where we think we should be cutting. Because I feel like I can't go, I'm not educated enough to say to somebody, well, if we don't get the money, there'll be cuts. What are the cuts? I don't know what the cuts are because we haven't sat down and talked about what the cuts are. I can, I can guess. We can all guess. Um, but I think that the, that the cuts need to be prioritized. We need to, to understand how deep they'll go because I think at this point any cut we make is a very deep cut. So that's what I would like to get out of a budget workshop. Um, that, that's all. Mr. Grady. Well, I think the, the, the list that Dr. Schumann gave us will give you right. what the cuts will be on the amount of money that, you know, right. and he went down there. And what we're looking at is larger classrooms, loss of programs, loss of teachers, and basically 
destroying the, the school system in this town. Um, what I don't get, and what I said last time at the meeting, is we presented a budget that was something that was carrying us over from this year to next year. We changed our budget format to make it more presentable to the town council so they can't use the excuse, we don't understand your budget. We did that. We did everything that we asked them to do. We gave them a budget that doesn't ask for anything. Well, I'm sorry, one thing, because we wanted to add the, add the new uh, culinary uh, position for the for new high school. But that's all, we, that's all we added. And what I said last time is I don't know where the common sense is with the town manager saying, we're going to cut you another two point something million dollars. I mean, I don't see them cutting two million dollars out of the police department budget. I don't see them cutting two million dollars out of the public works department. I see them cutting the education budget every single year. Cut their budget, okay? Let's let's prioritize the the the, the common sense in this town and cut their budget. See how they react. Mr. Peabody and then Mr. Neville. Vinny, you're absolutely right. However, um, one of the things that needs to be done in, in proposals, and this is a budget proposal, we gave them numbers, we gave them some information, but what we didn't give them is the quantifiable and qualifiable value add that the school gives, school department does for our, for our children. And that is our next step. We have to show our test scores. If they're good, hey, look what we accomplished. If they're not so good, this is where we need to improve, and this is why we need to continue funding and keeping our classroom sizes where they're at and our staff staffing levels where they're where they're at. So that that's what we need to do. I mean, anytime I've ever given a presentation, we've always said, "Hey, this is where this is what we're doing right, and this is where we need to improve." And that is something that I think in in, in this sector here we're, we're 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 gun shy because we do not have the commitment from the community because the community should be beating down town council's doors, not ours. We have to come in, and and we ought not to. That that's something that we need to get out there. We need to have that commitment. I think Tim brought up the ITPC charges. We cannot do things economically, and what Mrs. Dombrowski was saying today: what's the cost of technology? We cannot lease hardware. Why? Because we're afraid that we won't get the commitment to continue to lease. We'll have to cut that versus or cut something else out of a budget. We need to get that kind of a commitment in writing from our town councils, brothers and sisters, to make sure that we can sit there and bring our yearly operating costs down. That would be a huge impact. And it would be a huge debt in that $2 million that we have for hardware and software and stuff that we have in our budget. So those are the type of efficiencies I think we've been talking about for the year that I've been on the board. And like I said, I just learned about this recently. We do that, we can save some money, we can, we can, we can level set our increases to maybe augment or, or offset rather some of the costs that we get through contract and insurances. Every, every bit helps and we're talking not just you know a few tens of thousands of dollars, we're talking significantly more than that. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Neville, uh, Ms. Thurston and then Ms. LeBlanc. Okay, just for the public's sake, I, ITPC is the technology department, yeah. okay? It's, a, it's an acronym, I forget what it stands for, but it's basically technology. Uh, and I think we're 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 more than co willing to cooperate and work with whoever to to reduce those numbers. We've just had a hard time getting a meeting together to to deal with that prior to the budget season. That was our goal from day one, as I recall. Um, I think we also have to sit down and and I'm you know that this list of 13 pages of, of things here. I, there's nine of us. I, I don't think we should be prioritizing that because we don't have to do the day-to-day -day running of the district. I think the superintendent has to make it work, and I think the superintendent should be presenting that to us. We can change it, okay? But I think he knows th what the needs are, what the educational needs are, what we're obligated to do by law, what, what we, can, we can trim back, and what the impact's gonna be. And, and you know, it certainly puts him in a tough position, but he has the knowledge background to do that, and I, I would like to see that presented to us. I don't see it as a, you know, prioritize as we go down, these are the things. I think the public has a right to know what types of things can happen, what the priority is, and, and how that would impact them. And we spent a long time trying to get this list together so that it was transparent and people knew what would happen if we end up getting cut. This is horrific, 
uh, what, what's here. I, you know, I can't even imagine doing this. And I'm not ready to give up the ghost yet. I still think the council um, you know, has, has the wherewithal to work with us. And I think, as I said in my opening comments, we need to develop a, 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 the, the wisdom and the, uh, the, um, the ability to, to basically collaborate and cooperate to come up with something that's good for the town. That's the need. It isn't about me. It's not about partisan politics. It's not about that we spend too much money. We're sitting down here and giving an honest budget. And I think this board has worked together to try to come up with an honest budget that deals with the needs of the, of the community. And uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know how we would suffer this kind of thing. And it is, I do mean suffer. And uh, I think um, that we need the council to work with us to try to come up with that. And uh, whatever we have to do, I don't care how many meetings we have to go to, I'm more than willing to do it. I think this board would too if it would mean educating them about these needs. It's not about going back to us and saying, you guys choose what you spend the money on. No, it isn't. We have so few things that we have control over, okay, <laughs> that we can spend money on. It's contractual, it's state, it's, it's, uh, it's regulations, it's whatever. Okay, and, and finally, to pick up on, on your comment, Tom, um, you're encouraging people to go to the state. I agree with you. But I have no control of the state. The only thing that people have local control over is the Board of Education and the Town Council. We can't do this alone. We did it last year alone. Very, very few people came out, and very few people even came to the meeting and supported our budget, and we took a million-dollar hit. Okay? If that happens again, it's going to be a $2.8 million, $2.9 million hit, and, and you don't want to see what it's going to look like. Ms. Thurston. You know what? I'm going to pass because listen to everybody talk. In my head, I can't, I can't get it to come out other than I'm pissed. Excuse <laughs> my language. You know what? I'm just going to say it. These are our students. We should not be treated like the ugly stepchild. And we go through this every flipping year. If you want the best for the children, how is cutting $2 million in a school budget going to help these kids. We want them to succeed. They need to get their heads out of you know where, and they need to start working with us and do what is best for these kids. I'm sorry. I, I'm i pissed. I'm sorry. That's it. Ms. LeBlanc. So what I would like to say a little bit, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I guess for me, I've been, this will be my fourth year on the board. Mm -hmm. And maybe other constituents could learn a little bit from the fact that I don't feel like there's a Republican-Democrat divide on the board. No, you're right. um, there's Democrats working with Republicans. There's Republicans working with independents. There's independents, you know, working with Democrats. It, it's very bipartisan. And you're finding people saying, I agree with Tim, or I agree with, I agree with Peter. Surprisingly, I agree with Peter. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's showing that whether we, there's going to be some things we disagree on. There's going to be things that we agree on. But our common goal is to do what's best and get the most that we can. And people have done that due diligence to try to get the best they can out of the budget. I know for me, um, you know, I have to sit and watch uh, the, the talk about the security and increasing the budget for that and that if, if it doesn't pass, it's public safety money. Well, that's an awful lot of money to not have to use anymore, and what are you going to do with that? But, yeah, I have to look at this $2.8 million and, and think about that's going to come out of it's going to cause increased class sizes. What else is it going to cause? A lot of heartache. And... Like I said, I don't know if it's to be feared that this board is a more of a bar bipartisan board than I've ever seen it. Um, but I appreciate everybody's efforts on it um, when I couldn't be as involved as I needed to be. And I will add with this, though, I don't want to be on the policy committee if people are going to the hospital <laughs> after the meeting. <laughs> I'll stay on the finance committee meeting. No. But no, all kidding aside, I, you know, um, <laughs> as much as we'd like to, like... <laughs> You know, we don't agree a lot, but we all agree on on the frustration that we deal with when it comes to funding the education budget what and what we want for kids and class sizes and teachers and straight across the board. Ray. Thank you, Tom. A few points. One, the document that we, we got out and got together back uh, that Dr. Schumann gave us back in February, the 13-page 
document that showed us the impact of when we reduced our budget. I think this is the first time we've ever done that, a board's done that, that I know of since I've been back in town for 15 years. And that has people talking. It has people talking at PTO meetings, but it has our counselors understanding as well. And this is kind of what I meant before when I said we have to show them what's going on with our schools, the value that we bring, and the impact. It's not just them, it's the people that Peter was, was talking about, he's not a, a proud member of, those folks in town that are on fixed incomes. The financial situation that we'll end up in will be coming directly from, our, from the town council. And the one thing I picked up on is in, in, in the town manager's presentation, in counselor's comments, is there's a town budget and there's a school budget. Kind of think that we are the town of Enfield. There's no them, there's no us, there's just us. I think Scott said it the best, it's just us. And I think we're down the path to get to being us. Um, last April 30th, we had a budget hearing, zero Enfield parents were there. I counted zero. And that's what we need. If you guys want us to fight for your children, our children, you gotta help us. We need that help. We need you there. If you're afraid to speak in public, find someone who's not. I would contract Liz Davis myself. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, we need not just fingers on a keyboard on Facebook, we need butts in the seats, guys, as Tom Collins said, an author that I read quite frequently. Um, in terms of our state legislature, having been a part of a very activist group back in the 70s, yes, I am that old, um, we would get people from different towns to form a coalition. We have two people in the House, in, in, in the, uh, on the State Assembly for on the representative side. We have one senator. You have a slew of people in southern Connecticut where, where the highest population is. The only way we can get, our, get things like, like Tom was saying and, and uh, Tim was saying and, and everybody's been saying is we got to get people from other towns involved. Because otherwise, this little old town of Enfield with 46,000 people fighting it out. So that's what we need. So that's how we get things done. That's how we did it in Western Mass when I was a kid. And that's how they did it just recently with the Big Dig. Notice the tolls were down from, from Springfield down to uh, Stockbridge. They were eliminated because they said, hey, what's in it for us? You're giving all the money down the other end of the state. That's the type of attitude we need to nurture in this town. Um, this board, like, like Tina said, we're, not, we're, we're a board of education. We work well together. We don't always agree, but we build consensus. That's been the really fun part of being on this board of education. Um, and I'll tell you, we're becoming a force. We're a force for our kids, but a reasonable force. We can't just sit there and say, we want money, want money, want money. We've got to justify it. We have to make sure that we're asking for the right amount, not too much, not too little, just right. And that's what we have to do. We have, to be, we, we have two primary responsibilities with a governance body for the school system, and we're the fiduciary body of the school system. And that's where our responsibilities lie. Thank you. Peter and then uh, Tina. Well, as Tim said earlier, and I know I said this a couple months ago, because I made the comment, I remember looking over there saying, it's, it's the job, because of the pay that they get, of our superintendent and assistant superintendent to come up with the budgets and show what cuts and how they'll affect them. And now I'm hearing it again, and I'm glad I'm hearing it again. These are the guys we've hired to do that job. You think we have a hard job? We, we do. But that's what they're for. That's why they get the money. Otherwise, we'd be getting the money, and they'd be volunteering their time. <laughs> I didn't think that would go over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, when it comes to making the decisions of what goes on in the schools all the time, too. And I'm not saying this in any disrespect to anybody sitting up here. But most of you guys don't know what goes, really goes on in the schools, you know? And I'll say again, and not to toot our horns, but Tim was there, I was there. And you know what the back things are going. I'm telling you right now, I used to, you know, I know it bugged him. I'd go out on the bleachers sometimes on hot days and teach my classes. You know, I don't need a fancy class. Um, but the things that go on there, we're not, as a board collectively, 
don't have the knowledge that they're supposed to have to say, okay, geez, I hate doing this, but I have to, and this is where it's going to be. And I'd hate it for us to take that mentality of what I think a lot of public officials have done in the past, where, oh, we're going to make cuts, oh, we got to cut firemen, cops, and what, there's another one in that group. Uh, I don't think it was teachers. But, you know, they, they just go right to the very obvious stuff, knowing that they're spending a lot of money elsewhere. Um, I can remember saying, and I'm not trying to get into any negotiation ploy or anything here, but I told you guys very early on when we started doing the contracts, look at the Social Security raises, and that's the raises that you got to go by. We didn't. Went way by that. And now, again, this is adding on to the costs that we have. I just need to be careful, Peter. I know. I, I, and I'm being careful, and I'm done on that. Um, as far as, you know, doing what's best for our kids, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't want to do what's best for their kids. There may be a lot of people out there saying, I've done my share for kids. I can't afford it anymore. Um, but you got to be careful. I think you have to be careful when you, when you start talking like that because, you're, we're, this is Enfield, Connecticut. We're a, u a unique community unto our own. We've gone from being an all-American city to where we've progressed now. And in the 40 years or so I've lived in this town, I've seen radical changes. And as, when it comes to education, you can only offer so much. And with what you have, you do the best you can. Keep striving to get more, but you're not always going to get it. And then when you get what you have, that's when you got to do the best you can with what you have. And I'm telling you, uh, to the day I leave this board, I still look at that voc ed. I mean, Rubio just ran. I don't know if anybody watched his statements last night, but he was big on getting into um, uh, uh, the voc ed areas that we need electricians and, you know, people who can, kids who can graduate from high school and get a job as opposed to somebody going to college, running up a $100,000 bill and living in their parents' basement for the next 10 years. Um, huh? <laughs> Which one? I tried to help one of them. Uh, That's what happened. So, um, you know, we tried uh, the voc ed, and, and we're not, we, we're not even, we can't even think of doing anything like that right now. And then the other one, the alternative ed, I mean, that's a group that has just been left out year after decade after decade, I'll go on to say. I mean, these, some of these kids that go over to uh, Alcorn, uh, kids that have been expelled and stuff like that. <laughs> I know just about all the teachers that are teaching over there and the success that they're having with some of the kids. When you only got one or two or three or four, you can work miracles. You really can. And I've actually had people call me up saying, you know, what can you do to keep my kid over there as opposed to going back? And, I mean, it's a sad state of affairs, but not having an alternative ed program, and I think we've, we've passed some opportunities with the closing of buildings, you know, to have that. And, I mean, it would take a lot of work to set it up, but I think it's, you know, these are two groups, the voc ed and the alternative ed, which is a, a good size number of kids that we're just – passing by once again. We really are. And a lot of you like to go to a lot of these functions at, at, the, at the schools and everything. You're always seeing the best that a school has to offer. That's what you see. And, and you can say all the positive things that you want. But look underneath and find out the kids that are getting missed by the boat. There's a lot of them, an awful lot. And I'm telling you, I'd rather be working with those kids and the public never sees anything, but when we're helping those kids, than putting a show on for you all the time, you know? So, okay. Tina. Just on, on Peter, one time we were having a conversation about that voc ed and, our, and uh, the alternative ed, and I remember you said that you found teaching those kids was always very rewarding. Yeah, I remember you saying that. I don't always remember what you say on purpose, but I remembered that. <laughs> as long as you remember some. <laughs> um, but one of the things that when we were first talking about the budget, I think around Thanksgiving or even Christmas time, um, and it's something that Ray brought up, which is a very um, interesting point. When you see a $64 million number 
that is not all funded from the town. It's the ECS cost sharing grant. So when you see $64 million, like they were saying, $29 million last year was came, coming from the state, and then the differential was given from the town. It's not $64 million for the from the town, and I think that's important um, for people to understand that and know that. It's almost, it's a little less than 50-50, but that's, that's important for people to know, and it was a good point. Ray and then Tim. Thank you. One thing, uh, Peter, I, I want to point out to you is that what that happened this year for, for people who want to go into voc ed is we're able to finally forge a, a relationship or a more of a partnership with this Nuntuck, where they're bringing in modern, I say modern, but bringing up-to-date uh, technologies uh, for machining, for uh, other other manufacturing type of things. So so that program is is well on its way to to take care of that shortfall that you you, you mentioned, um, and I, I think that's just a, something that needs to be be brought out there. Are there. Is there more that we can do? Yep, but like you said, we only have so much money in the bucket, and you know we got to be able to take care of pretty much all the kids. If you don't mind, let me just respond to that real quick, please. Because I remember years ago, Tom, you were still around. When, you know, I had talked about bringing in Porter Chester, bringing in other businesses and stuff like that years ago to start doing some of this stuff. So if it's happening now with un as Nuntuck, great. But if, if this is the pace that we're going to go to help these kids, you know, I'd rather find something a little quicker. And I still think there are other pl places that we can reach out to. I mean, I see what Lego is doing, and I'm not particularly a fan of that because I still think for a lot of reasons I'm not a fan of it. Um, but if you brought in some other companies that could actually work with kids to help them get a job or at least an internship after they graduate and stuff like that and then get them employed, you know, I mean, I'd do anything to get that happening quicker. And I've run into kids who have personally thanked, you know, if it wasn't for this teacher or this shop teacher or something like that, you know, I never would have finished high school. Mr. Neville and then Mr. Peabody. I think one of the things we... Oh, Mr. Peabody, sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to take a moment. That happened last year. Peter, that happened last fall. Uh, there was a symposium, or maybe it might have been last spring, where businesses came into, and Dr. Schumann and Ann McKiernan went to a session where they actually outlined their needs, and they offered their assistance in, in helping. Uh, so that that is happening. may not have happened back in your day but or, or earlier, but it is happening now. And that's all I'm going to say to that. Uh, Tim, you probably can go more. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Dr. Schumann has been a huge advocate of, of bringing the business in there since his first day on the job. And and I think Lego is just one of the partners that we have. We've, we've been working in developing partners and grants. I mean, I think Ann and, and Michelle and, and, and that whole crew have brought in probably much more than their pay in grants. Okay? And, and, and almost. almost. We're getting close, though. But, and, and I think we really pushed hard on that side of it because we have no way to get revenue, okay? And get a grant to help support a program is a good thing, and, and, and I think they've been really concentrating their efforts to do that. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Schumann and, and his cabinet and the administration have really worked hard to get business involved with us. And there's a lot of things that go on that we don't know about on a day-to-day -day basis that have just been building over the last three or four years. Um, but I think it's, it, in my opinion, it's time to kind of wrap this stuff up. Where it's a little cathartic right now to go. We're all frustrated with what's been happening here, and I think we're all committed to what we want to do for kids, but we don't have the specifics. And I think the idea of the workshop is good. We're scheduled to do that on Monday. I don't know whether Dr. Schumann has a suggested time frame and a place for us to do that, um, but um, I, I think that would be the better place to continue this discussion. Just one person's opinion. Just to button it all down before we move on to the next one, I promise I'll be brief. Um, the Board of Education comes up with a budget that they believe they need. The Town Council then determines what we can afford as a town. That's how it works. That's how it's worked for eons and eons and eons and eons. That's our job. We present to the board to the Town Council, this is what we think we need, and then the town then makes a determination as to what we can afford. Now to tag, to, to bookend some of the other comments that I've heard, Peter, I... I understand what you're saying about Bo VOAC, but I also agree with the idea that you can't, we can't talk about it. We can't afford it. I know that. And, and I'm going to go back to 
an example that I, I tried to articulate the last time we met. As a business person who's used to building things, if I have a customer who's demanding that I build a 12 million square foot building and will only pay me for 5,000 square feet, I can't do that. I will go bankrupt very quick. That's where we're at. I don't blame the town. I don't hold the town accountable for things that are coming down from higher above. That's not an intellect. That's not. A, that's not a accurate argument. That's that's smoke and mirrors argument. That's taking to say well, we can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. You lobby the people who are having the direct impact on what we as a board have to do. That's not the town. That's the folks that are in the capital. That's the folks that are in the national capital. Those are the guys that are setting the agenda and pushing this stuff down onto us. When it came to putting in like all day kindergarten, I was in favor of it because we were planning on doing it anyway. And we were planning on doing it to help address some of our remediation rates. Because I don't mind spending the money, I just don't like spending it twice. If you're doing it right the first time, then you're not wasting money the second time. And I'm sorry, if you're not getting it right the first time, and you have to, that's that's a problem. That's 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 where we steered it. That's why we have the programs that we have. That's why we fight so hard for those programs. That's why we have early intervention. That's what it's called, early intervention. That's why we do it. And it costs money. And those are the programs that we need. And there's a whole lot of other programs that we don't. That costs money, and and I'm sorry, I, I have a hard time. I have a hard time with bureaucracies. I have a hard time with job justification. I have a hard time with people who empower themselves to create jobs that they have to justify all the time. And I see that at the state level. I see that at the federal level. It's what it is. So again, we're working with our friends at the council. We're working very hard to try to get a budget working. I don't blame them for the, the budget situation. I don't. That's not fair. It's the people that say, oh, by the way, we're going to increase the demands that you have so you have even less than 0.02% of sway over what you're doing in your school district. That's the reality. That's not a myth. And the only way that changes is if you call the folks that are higher up the food chain. It's not about what hat you wear, and it's not about what team that you're playing on. It's about doing what's right and holding those folks accountable. They're the ones that are responsible for the mess. Moving on. Uh, yeah, here we go again. Are Building committee. Are we, are we setting the, the time just before we leave this? I thought we already did. I didn't hear that. I, I, April 20th. April 20th. Okay, after the tour? After the tour. Okay, fine. Um, building, I, I, as I... Building committee. Mr. Hamill. I, I, have no, I have no report at this point because I went to the future use of Fermi meeting instead. Future use of Fermi. We are going to be meeting again. Um, again, I'm, I'm saying it. The, the board will make the decision as to what is going on. The future use of Fermi has been struggling to get the information, but they're trying to get the information. And they're working with the information that they have. Um... They will make a presentation. I wanted it to be done with a long time ago, too. I just, un you, you can make requests and make requests and make requests, and sometimes it takes a long time to get the information. And I'm not one to have meetings just to have meetings, so. I will keep you posted as to other things that are coming down the pipe. I have a question for you. Is there anything else that you've requested that we don't have yet? We just got a rough number for um, the science wings. And some of the stuff is, I mean, I, I could make request after request after request for every itemized detail. Uh, what I'm asking is, is there things that you've requested that we haven't got yet that will help us make our decision? Right now, I believe I have what, well, other than what, what, what has been pointed out about uh, JFK, which I, that's an entirely different animal. I got to have to look into that some more. Um, but for a Fermi, we've gotten pretty much everything that the committee has asked for. It's just it's taken a long time to get it. Well, I would recommend probably in the future, whether it's you or whoever else sits in that chair, you got the power of the pulpit right here. And if we're looking for stuff and we're not getting it, 
than say it publicly so everybody knows we're trying to get it. <laughs> I'm serious. I did quite sharply in one meeting where I thought I was going to have a pen thrown at me. There you go. All right, moving on. Um, approval of the minutes, regular meeting minutes, March 24th, 2015. Do I have a motion to I approve? Move. Second. A motion made by Mr. Neville, seconded by Ms. Thurston. Do I have any discussion or alterations? Since a none show of hands, approve the minutes. Motion passes. Approval of accounts and payroll, do we have any? Okay. Correspondence and communications. Yep, we have, uh, oops. we have the invitation to the Memorial Day Parade in your packets. It's on May, uh, May 24th. All really? personnel are invited. Hope you can attend. That's it. For the record, uh, Ms. Zungeyer abstained from the approval. Second round of board audiences, Mary Scott. Oh, for the record, I've been allowing more than three minutes because I've, there hasn't been too much of a demand. I know I said three, but I've been allowing about five. So the longest we've had is 5.2. So go ahead. So you have a minute and a half, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, is it on? Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. As long as the light's red, it's on. What? Okay, good. Huh? What? Funny. <laughs> Funny. What? I see we're all punchy at the end of the evening here. <laughs> uh, Mary Scott, 64 Yale Drive. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to speak earlier uh, so I could get some feedback from um, our board members. I was actually at a PTO meeting, so <laughs> other obligations going on as well. Um, it was interesting listening to everybody tonight discuss the budget um, and what's going on. Um, I just wanted to kind of give a little feedback with regard to um, the fact that I have a parent, in, I mean, I'm a parent of a student who's in the magnet schools. And on Monday, they did um, Magnet School Advocacy Day um, in Hart. Hartford basically at the legislative office building. So I spoke with um, a couple of our representatives um, with regards to magnet schools and spoke to, you know, Crack and some of the bigger people who have run the magnet schools, so on and so forth. And one of the things that have really concerned me as a parent is the fact that our local board of ed and other local board of ed have complained continuously about our magnet schools and their funding, so on and so forth. Um, part of the reason I think people need to, to know is it's out of Chef O'Neill decision, and that was why the magnet schools were created to help create that diversity. Um, my experience has been they have given my child a good education. Um, so far, I moved them into a correct school just because of the fact that it was best for my child. I don't. It's not always best for every child, but it's an option as a parent that I have. What I want to say is that when it came to doing the magnet schools, the state was supposed to properly fund them, and the state did not. And because of that, they're now looking to local Board of ed Educations to help deal with that deficit. That's why you're getting charged for the amount of money for kids to go to magnet schools. And I think people forget what used to happen or what happened many years ago. Um, and same thing with the, the grant formula, the ESC, is that the state was supposed to be 50% to you know, funding the towns. And as a state, we have failed in that regard. So I agree that we have problems on our state level and we do need to push them. And my discussions with the legislators were basically that they're in this really bad place because they've got this huge budget put together. They want to you know, they get, the, they get it. They get the Board of Eds are not getting the funding they need. They get all that. Um, it's finding the money and getting the state to, to take the responsibility seriously, you know. Um, but I just wanted to encourage you not to pit public schools against the magnet schools. They each provide their own piece. I have two children in our public schools here in town, but then I have a child in the magnet school. And I don't want them it to become a debate, you know, magnet schools are bad, so on and so forth. Um, because really, it's, it's just a different opportunity, just like the VOAG school. It's a different opportunity for our kids. And... When it comes down to it, I, I think that working together is the best way to do things and not to kind of make each other adversarial over things. Because I believe that magnet schools have a place. I really do. Um, you know, I don't, not all of our kids will need to go to one or want to go to one, and, and that's okay. So um, the other piece I wanted to mention um, this evening is, you know, I heard people talking about the fingerprinting. Um, I have never been a huge supporter of the fingerprinting since the beginning. It has um, made things incredibly difficult in our schools for our volunteers to come in. Um, I have a book fair coming up the week after um, this, our school vacation. 
right now I got to run all the names of my volunteers, which are only three, for four days and having at least maybe about five hours each day. I have three volunteers, and they have to make sure that they all have background checks done or they're fingerprinted and so on. And it really is just, I mean, it makes it so incredibly difficult. It makes it so I get put in the position as a parent that either we have a book fair or we don't, that we benefit our classrooms or we don't. And because we don't have the volunteers to, to step up and do the work, and it's kind of handicapped the schools. The other thing is there's been a big debate about, about field day huge people are talking about that i mean parents are like well we need to know if we have to take the day off from school you know to take the day off from work so we can be there but do we have to get fingerprinted do we have to go through this process do we and it's just so confusing for everybody so i really feel that that issue needs to be resolved as quickly as possible even though i know it's policy issue so on and so forth but it really has affected parents this year um you know, so, and that's pretty much about it. So I won't keep you guys any longer so you can be done for the evening. Good night. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mary. Bethany Owlette. Hello. Hello. Um, Bethany Owlette, 24 Betty Road. Just a few things, some of them from previous. Um, in the discussion of Common Core and the SBAC testing, um, just like you to consider not only how Common Core is perceived, but also how it's applied in the classroom and how it's rushing our students to be prepared for a test. And with all our numerous snow days and everything else, um, I can tell you my fourth grader was, is extremely frustrated especially with this Common Core math, um, because they are rushed through a lot of these strategies um, to the point where I have parents, I know of parents in other school districts, like when we talk strategies and having to YouTube or Google, um, they actually are proposing a parent night to learn these strategies. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I went through school. <laughs> it's like, so I, under, you know, and my fourth grader becomes extremely frustrated to the point where he's emotionally upset. And I hate math. My child should not hate anything in fourth grade. I would hope that his desire to learn more would be fostered at that age and not hindered by feeling so frustrated and not confident about his abilities because he's rushed through so many different strategies because of Common Core. So just, I ask you to consider that side of it as well. Is it really helping our children build their confidence to learn um, and excel? Um, I'm glad to see that fingerprinting policy is still on the agenda, um, especially with the budget going on. I honestly thought when I came here in October and brought it up as a concern that it would get pushed to the side with budget. Um, so I'm glad to see that it's still on the forefront. It is hindering our volunteer involvement and our PTOs do provide so much in the schools um, that can't be done with the regular budget. At Barnard, where I'm on the PTO and heavily involved, um, our book fair, you know, we're able to do a summer reading program for our kids. Every kid goes home with two to three uh, grade level books for the summer. You know, and not every family always has grade level books in their home. And we're able to provide that through PTO um, so they have that for the summer to keep them going. Um, iPads, we were able to purchase iPads, additional iPads for the classrooms. And just um, support the teachers with the field trip funding and also some of the other computer programs that they use, we've been able to finance. So not having the volunteers really hinders that. And um, the last thing I want to bring up is the state mandate. Um, I know there's a lot of things on the budget that are mandated. And I think, you know, I'm not a lifetime, lifetime resident of Enfield, um, but seeing how things have been done, like with the high school consolidation, when that effort went forward, we really got a lot of great information about what was going on. And I think people had information to make an educated decision. And, you know, we want people to go out, we want them to contact, you know, our state legislators, but they don't have 
the information at hand maybe as easily as you do. And I know the list of possible cuts to our budget, I know I've brought it up at PTO meetings at two schools, and they're, you know, it has woken people up. It has, they're like, wow, wait, hold on, my kid's involved in that. And I think if we could have a list, if you want us to do that, then they need to be educated as to what our expenses are based off of those state mandates on our town. Um, and how that truly affects them. Because you're not gonna go to your, you know, senator or representative and say, you know, we just need these state mandates funded when they don't know what they are. You know, they need to be educated. Um, so if we can give them a list of those cuts, then I think we should be able to give them what our expenses are for those mandates. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have a need for executive session? We do no. not. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made by Mr. Grady, seconded by Ms. Thurston. Any discussion? Sensing none. Show of hands. Congratulations. We're adjourned.